Uh, to get started, uh, let me just say this is a good time to reflect uh, for several reasons. Uh, for me, I've changed jobs. I was uh, truly weary of running a research institute after 14 years, and so I quit. But that means not that I'm unemployed. Many of you seem to think I've retired. I have no intention of ever retiring. Uh, what I have become is a senior advisor, and during the year at hand, I'm going to have a sabbatical. And uh, in the academic world, that's supposed to mean that you think relevant thoughts about your discipline. And so I propose to think relevant thoughts about my discipline. Now, I can uh, do that uh, without fear of anything going wrong with what I started, because John Shook uh, has replaced me. Don't know how many of you have gotten my e-letters over the years. Uh, John has taken those over as of this month. Uh, he will find a different voice. This is not me. This is not me. This is someone else. But this is someone who probably knows a lot more than I do. So I hope you'll stay tuned. Uh, I might be writing some uh, articles and um, reflection pieces uh, from time to time, but I'm not going to be in the monthly uh, e-letter business from this point. Um, it's also a good time to reflect because uh, we are at a point where uh, those organizations that were so splendidly leading the way for us, uh, I think, have transitioned to maturity. Uh, this happens in life, and uh, that's not necessarily bad. What it means is that we've had some leaders, sort of some rabbits that we were out there chasing. Uh, they're going to be around, but I don't think they will be spectacularly successful beyond all others in the future the way they have been, and that means we need to do some work ourselves. Uh, let me say, I would be a little disappointed at this point in history, after 20 years of my work with Dan trying to explain how Toyota does it, if everybody else hadn't gotten a lot better. And that's what's happened in that industry, that it's very hard now to find a bad car. Uh, you know, possibly, uh, you know, Range Rover, uh, Land Rover accepted. Uh, cars actually work. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyone here? Um, it's hard to find a bad car. You really have to work at it. And that's not for no reason. Uh, Ford's been doing uh, quite well recently because they have retrofitted the Toyota product development system on the old Ford mess they had uh, with some help from people we know very well. So this is actually good. But it does mean that our story gets a little more complicated. What the world wants us to do is to point to one person or one organization that does everything right and all you need to do is copy them. And that was actually sort of possible for us for a while. And now we have to move on. And this is sort of painful that uh, the world is afflicted with what I call Mega Mura. Uh, Mura, if you remember Mura Muri Muda, uh, Mura is the variation that you experience that is not actually caused by some change in desire on the part of the customer. It's just something has gone wrong in the process. And what has gone grotesquely wrong is the regulation of the macroeconomy, which is a process. Regulation is a process just as other types of value creation or processes. And it turns out after all of these years and all of these professors with theories, uh, we can't do it. But uh, that is a major problem for the lean movement because actually we don't have an answer. Uh, now, if they'd let us manage the economy, that's an interesting thought. Uh, perhaps we would get, uh, you know, an A3 for the economy and so forth. Um, uh, we might get a better result, but we have to live in a world where uh, you have a grotesque fluctuation in fundamental basic demand, not because any customer has changed their wants or needs, but because all of their savings disappeared. And so that does just make a harder time for us. So that's where we are. And it requires a little bit of reflection. Indeed, uh, what we will call Hansei. Hope everybody knows the term Hansei. Keep uh, introducing these Japanese terms, Obeya, Hansei, are relatively uh, recent arrivals. Uh, it is nothing but critical self-reflection. Critical self-reflection. What did we do? And I'm doing that in the form of where have we been? Uh, where are we now? And what's the gap? in terms of what we are able to offer the world and what the world needs. And if there is a gap, and there just might be, what is the root cause? And then finally, how do we move forward? With I, The answer is experiments. But what experiments? And how are we going to know that we are succeeding? Now, of course, that's nothing but, uh, if you will, a, a three for the lean movement. 
I'm not going to do that in the formal sense of laying out an A3 on the screen. Uh, one of the interesting things about A3 is that it doesn't go with PowerPoint. Uh, it's uh, actually quite useless. Uh, you need to all have, well, wait a minute, you should all be looking at the wall where you've got your A3 and everybody touching it should be there. Uh, no room full of people uh, doing whatever uh, with this uh, thing on the screen. Uh, doesn't work. I think that's a good thing. So we're not going to do that. But what this really is, is a brief, brief, brief A3 uh, for the lean movement. By the way, when I say lean movement, I mean all of us who, uh, for some reason or other, were born as earnest improvers. We just try to make things better. Uh, there are a lot of people in the world, don't know why, who don't seem to care, and then there's some other people who seem to enjoy making things worse. So therefore, this lean community, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is all of those people who are earnestly trying to make things better. And by the way, it turns out it's hard. So therefore, we should talk to each other. Where have we been? Well, look, the history is very long. Uh, most folks want to think that it all started with Taichi Ono or whatever uh, method you came into this or with Dr. Dimming um, and so forth. But actually, humans have been thinking for a very, very long time about better ways to design and operate the processes that create value. In life, all value is the result of a process, typically a complex process, that has to be operated and designed by people. So we've been thinking about this for a long time. Dan, uh, some years ago, went to Venice to look at the Arsenale, where they uh, actually were thinking about flow production at the end of the 1400s. And there have been many, many different contributions to this river of knowledge about how we can develop better processes to create what I call more perfect value. By the way, value is always in the mind of the customer. It is an existential thing. What the customer thinks is valuable is valuable. Our job as providers is to provide that value, and we hope to be rewarded. But it is uh, impossible to talk about a process without talking about what is the value that needs to be produced. Well, it's not impossible. People do it all the time, but it's a waste of time. So therefore, when I say more perfect value, I mean two things. One, quantitative value. We were able to make more widgets with less effort. But then qualitative value. Turns out people really didn't want a widget. They wanted to solve a problem. And the widget was a means to an end. And we've also not been very good at that, about precisely specifying what value really is. And I think we often don't get it quite right. Uh, for me, the perfect value with the minimum resource input is what lean is. It's nothing more, nothing less. Perfect value, minimum, it's never going to be zero. Uh, you know, that uh, quality may be free, but you'll never have resource-free value. So therefore, we want to minimize while perfecting the value. These efforts, and here we get to part of the problem. In recent times, in the last 110 or 20 years, most efforts aimed at earnest improvement have emerged from industrial engineering, from operations planning and control, from quality, which are typically functions within big organizations. And they are, by the way, staff functions within big organizations. Producing experts in large organizations. So it is functional experts with ideas about how other people can improve. Okay? And that's just, that's just is. It's not good or bad necessarily, but it does lead to some complications. Um, because the way the knowledge has gotten transmitted is in the form of tools, often deployed by staffs, in organizations full of creatures that I call modern managers. This is the line, the modern managers. Uh, those folks were invented. Um, well, Alfred Sloan certainly helped at General Motors. I think he really is the inventor of modern management. Uh, business schools are busy churning them out. Uh, some of you probably went to business schools. Some of you teach in business schools. That's OK. But the product is the modern manager. And modern managers apply tools, and in general, without a lot of effect. And so in fact, I think there's a fundamental problem here that lean process thinking, lean thinking is process thinking, is inherently horizontal because value flows across the organization horizontally to the customer. But the problem is that modern management is oriented vertically toward the CEO. You think about where do you look, you look up. Where's the customer sideways? 
And it's a very simple issue, vertical, horizontal. And so we're really good at being successfully vertical. By success, I mean your success, your organizational success, how you did, whether you optimized yourself. But we're abysmal at optimizing the value stream flowing sideways, the process producing the value for the customer. So that's just a problem. And here's my sum up on this. I think we won the battle of ideas about methods and tools. I don't get a lot of pushback. I don't find people wanting to tell me how good push is compared to pull. I don't want to hear people telling me that uh, 5S is a bad idea. I don't hear all things that I used to hear a long time ago, uh, the but, but if type things. Uh, by the way, including all of these lean management tools, what's happened now is that adding to Kanban and all the other kinds of process tools directly on the process. We have these lean management tools of strategy management, strategy deployment, Hoshin Conry, whatever you want to call it, uh, A3 analysis, uh, standardized work with standardized management. I hope you have some standardized management. And of course, Kaizen. So now we have management tools to go with the direct process tools, but note they are tools. A hammer without a carpenter or a hammer with a carpenter with some really bad ideas uh, is not going to produce a lot of value. But let's give ourselves a little bit of uh, credit. Let's have a little positive in this, Hansei. We have diffused uh, the methods, the tools, including now the management tools, to an enormous range of activities and industries. When Dan and I published Machine in 1990, it was a car story. It was a car story. And now, 20 years later, it is a healthcare story, and it is a government services story, and it's a government regulation story, and it's a financial services story. And hardly any of you here are in the traditional widget manufacturing world that we would have populated this room with 20 years ago. It's not to say those people have lost interest, it's to say we've all moved on. So there's been a steady expansion of the ripples when we went and dropped the lean pebble in the water. And that's a good thing. But as I say at the bottom, and the sum up here is this, uh, that we have yet to win the battle of sustainable, sustainable lean practice. And you've all doubtless been involved in regression toward the mean, where you thought you had made some progress and then you got a new boss, or you had a reorganization, or you had a merger, or an acquisition, or a divestiture, or a bankruptcy, or whatever you had, because those things happen in life and it turns out you actually hadn't done anything lasting. So sustainable lean practice, it seems to me, is our target, and that's what we would like to do for, and if you will, to the world. Now let's talk about leadership. What the world wants is heroic transformational leadership, someone who will make things better, someone who will make things better, the heroic CEO, uh, heroes of all kinds are always welcome. And when we say leadership, that is often what we mean. Someone who can group, convince a group of people for a short period of time to do things that aren't even in their interest to achieve some result. Uh, that person who simply has all the answers. Uh, you know, the answer man. That's what we want. And it was a man back in those days, wasn't it? You know, it's, we got the answers. And so when we say leadership, I think Below that word, there is this notion of someone with the answers who's going to make it better and get us out of this mess. And you see these corporate revitalization programs, which are always have a heroic figure who is going to do heroic things to produce amazing results in a very short period of time. And what those people are mostly doing is rework. Most of what the heroic leader is doing is rework. Alan Mulally, uh, Ford's done a wonderful job of dealing with the fact that the Ford management system was completely dysfunctional. And that's actually his contribution, is to have a different way to think about managing, particularly product development, which was not his invention, not even necessarily his idea, but has protected those who were applying it. So therefore, what you have is waves and waves of rework. The new leader with the new program, leaders always have to have a program, 
who is going to do miraculous things give us the answers to be followed by the next leader when there's nothing sustainable about what the current leader has done. So uh, my sum up here is that uh, we're all guilty of looking for too much heroic leadership and I believe the root problem, the root cause is that we don't have enough lean management. And then indeed our movement to this point has had very little to say actually about, useful to say about management. And that's where we need to go now. And so many of the folks I know in this movement come out of the different staff functions and uh, they just uh, say this is too hard. How am I going to change the management system of my organization? And I say, well, it, because this is so terribly hard, therefore we need to start immediately. Uh, let's not wait, let's do it right now. So let me talk a little bit about what I think the issue is. Uh, first off, uh, just real quick, and Dan talked about this uh, yesterday morning just for a little bit. Uh, same thing, slightly different words. What is the work of management? One of the things I uh, fell in love with uh, probably 20 years ago when we first started visiting Toyota in a serious way was that people would always ask, what is the work to be done here? that's different from the waste to be done here? What is the actual value creating work? And we know that managers are all very busy. All of you work very hard. You come in early, you stay late. But what do you do that actually creates any value? And the answer, by the way, is that most of you do rework. That most of your day is devoted to things gone wrong. The fact that nothing is capable, nothing is repeatable, nothing is available, nothing is nothing. And so therefore, at the end of the day, maybe there's a little meeting to talk about how we might think things better, but mostly what the work of management is, is rework. Which, by the way, you should do, because if everything's on fire, you really should get a fire hose and put it out. But why is everything on fire? So here are my list, the four things, that are the work of management. Number one is to gain agreement on the few important things that we should do now. By the way, I didn't say to tell everybody what the few important things we should do now are. I said gain agreement. There was a tool here, strategy management, Hoshin Connery, whatever you want to call it, and tools are good. A hammer is a great thing if you've got a carpenter who knows what to build. Second thing, work of management, is to deploy on those few things that are important to deal in real time with problems that come up, because problems always come up, they do, and to evaluate proposals that come up from below. And there we have PDCA embedded in A3. A3 is the context for PDCA. So much PDCA is free of context. What was the problem? Well, this was where we decided to do some improvement. That's because we're here. Okay. Third thing, stabilize the organization. Stabilize the organization. Why is nothing in your organization predictable or repeatable? Why do you spend most of your time doing rework and workarounds? What are you going to do to stabilize the organization? We have some tools for that. Standardized work, standardized management. That's where Kaizen is useful. And then the fourth thing, critically important, particularly for now, and this is the hard discontinuity that for right now, the most important work of management is to create the next generation of lean managers when you quite possibly are not yourself a lean manager. This requires a little magic. But this is what we need. So that's the work of management as I look at it. Let me just quickly compare the predominant management, I will call modern management, with what I'll call lean management. And the question for you is, who are you? Since you're the folks who are supposed to make this transformation through this discontinuity, uh, which are you? And so on the left side, I've got the modern manager. This is your business school manager. And on the right side, I've got a creature seldom seen uh, called the lean manager. And so you should just ask which one you are, because if you can't change your behavior, uh, basically all hope is lost. So I'll just go through this quickly. And by the way, all this is downloadable, and you can reflect on this on the way home. Okay, authority, which is to say you've got the answers and you're in control. Is that what you are as a manager? Versus responsibility. By the way, responsibility means taking responsibility for activities involving people over whom you have no authority. 
And that's that disconnection of authority and responsibility that I think is one of the brilliant Toyota contributions to management thinking. To disconnect the idea of authority and responsibility. And by the way, if you have people taking responsibility, you will have flexibility. The problem with the authority thing is it's inherently rigid because it's top down and you're supposed to do what you're told. Are you managing by objectives? You know, just get her done. Here's what you're supposed to do. Or are you managing by process? When you talk to your people, do you say, how are you doing on your objectives? And just say yes. And by the way, uh, give me the correct answer. Um, and instead, let's talk about your process. Tell me about your process and tell me what the problems are. Because I'm actually only interested in the problems. I don't really care about the things going right. I just care about the things going wrong. How can I help you? How can I help you? Okay. Um, okay, point number three, are you the boss that gives answers or are you the boss that asks questions? The natural pose for bosses is to give the answer. Here's the answer, you do it. By the way, the answer is based on the boss's experience in some previous situation, no longer relevant, but uh, there it is. And then finally, uh, we have a plan and my job as the manager is to impose the plan versus we are all going to do some experiments. Because in fact, all we've got is a hypothesis. All a plan is is a hypothesis. And what we now need to do, it's the P, we need to do the DCA. So what kind of manager are you? And then, how'd you learn how to do this? Formal education, went to business school, lots of credentials, years and years and years of irrelevant education. I'm, I uh, plead guilty. Um, or you've done gimbal learning through repetitive problem solving cycles. And then just a couple more. Who does the improvement? By the way, improvement is done by staffs after everything screws up. Our improvement is done by the line and everyone touching the process with the support of the staff. Where do you make decisions? Don't know how this happened, but modern managers love to go to conference rooms with PowerPoint and make decisions. It's really interesting. No walls, please, just the screen. We'll all sit here and look at the screen uh, and we'll use stale data about irrelevant uh, issues to make decisions about whatever it is that we need to make a decision about. Or do we say, hey, let's just get up, go see, ask why, show respect. That's uh, Cho's famous mantra, Fujio Cho, Toyota chairman, uh, on the gimba at the point where it's happening in real time. So what kind of manager are you? Standardization. Now, of course, most organizations have no standardization other than irrelevant, out-of-date SOPs. Uh, which uh, you couldn't possibly run anything with these SOPs, right, the standard operating procedures. The one thing you know for sure is they don't work. So then how do you standardize? Well, we haven't done it, but if we did it, we would have some experts, maybe some consultants, who would come in and standardize. Or do you ask the people actually operating the process to standardize their work? Right. And then finally, two more things actually. Do you go fast to go slow? Um, Everybody at MIT, it was just over there last week, assures me sometime during the conversation that they're a quick study, that they figure things out really quick. And that's really interesting. I say, you know, I used to be a quick study, but I never got anything done. And now I'm a slow study, and sometimes I actually do get something done. So do you really know what the problem is, and do you really do the analysis, or do you jump to solutions? Okay, the modern manager is the jump to solutions manager. Uh, the lean manager is the what the heck is the problem manager and what's the root cause? And how do we know? And have we been to the Gimba and talked to anybody so that we're not just dreaming? And sum it up, old fashioned modern manager, I hope they become old fashioned, is a vertical creature looking up, optimizing their point, their function, their box, even their company in a complex stream. And what we want to do as lean managers is to all the time think horizontally. Backwards from the customer, who's the only arbiter of value, to say what does this process need to do for this customer at this point in time. So, um, here's what leadership is gonna need to do, is to put in place some lean management. Okay, and by the way, more and more of this is needed because modern problems for consumers uh, are getting more and more complicated. Most people actually want their problem solved rather than just some stuff. 
sell me a brilliant object or solve my problem, which is it going to be? Management of problem solving is much harder than management of object delivery. So that's where we are, where the world is now. And we have this very weak tradition. So moving forward, what we need to do, we need some transformational leaders whose contribution is going to be to put in place lean management. That's a different kind of leadership. Because of me now, we are going to behave in a different way starting with me. Because of me now, we will behave in a different way starting with me. By the way, start anywhere. I have so many stories over so many years of people in impossible positions and organizations who changed their behavior and made something different. If we had more time, I would go through a few. For whatever length of value stream you have some interest in, by changing your behavior. And if we all did that, we wouldn't need any more heroic leaders. Uh, my mission is to eliminate the need for heroic leadership. It is work around, rework leadership. Feels good in the short term, but why does it not feel good in the long term? Well, now we know. Okay, just quickly. Um, and this is a Dan and Jim a hobby horse, just forgive us, uh, that um, we've absolutely got to now do some experiments with what we call value stream managers, who are people who are given the mandate to actually think horizontally. And that doesn't mean that any of the resources that they're thinking about are under their control. This is not an authority job. This is a thinking job with regard to how are we doing in our core processes and our support processes to actually serve the need of the customer. And what's the gap? And then if we do have a gap, what's the root cause? And then if there is a root cause, what are the countermeasures? Please never use the word solutions. I try to take it out of my vocabulary. Life is nothing but countermeasures. Every countermeasure creates new problems. So no problem is solved like that. It's just countermeasure. And then we move on. This is not a job. This is a way of thinking. You don't need to change the org chart. That's not the point. This is to find someone who is identified as taking responsibility for thinking in your organization about your key primary and support processes. Anybody able to, on a wall, show you the process? Can we, on the wall, uh, through an A3 process, get agreement on what the problem is, what the gap is, what the root cause is, what the countermeasures are? So that's what we need to do. Note that they run wall to wall, end to end, across complex organizations for which no one, in fact, can have overall authority. And they are grotesquely, in today's world, so optimized. Points, point optimization, we're good at. Process optimization, we're terrible at. So here's what we need to do. I've got two minutes left to explain this. As a group, as a community, um, we're going to need to do a lot of A3 on how you introduce a better management system. By the way, for your organization, when you go home, a great little A3 exercise, little he said, is to sit down and say, what is the state of our management system? In fact, what is our management system? And what is the gap between what it can produce? Don't forget, Deming said a process only produces what it is able to produce, never more and sometimes less. What is your management process? And what is the result of that process and what are the problems? We're going to need to do some experiments. And then uh, time for some countermeasures. Uh, in doing that, uh, we need as a community a better way to report our results. My view is that all A3 should be public. You shouldn't just post them on the wall. When you get through, post them on the web. The whole world ought to be able to look at A3. We have this tragedy of the commons right now that people every day are trying things that don't work, and the next day people somewhere else are trying the same thing that doesn't work. It's just an amazing waste of human creativity and energy. So what could we do about that? I don't have an answer, but what could we do about that? I do have a question. Can we become a community of scientists? By the way, sharing failure as well as success, the most valuable thing you're going to do is fail. Could you tell the rest of us about it? And that's the last thing any of us have been trained to do. Whatever you do, don't talk about your failures. All right, so this is a big leap. 
But anyway, I do see that if we actually want to have some lasting success to create sustainable lean practice, we now really have to think systematically, scientifically about management. And that is the great challenge for our community moving forward. Now, I've not retired at all. I've just stopped, well, managing. I was running an organization. I was just doing reworks and workarounds, firefighting. And so I said, much better for me uh, to actually think about management rather than do management. But don't, don't be too hard on me. Uh, at least I'm honest. Um, what I would love to do is hear about people's experiments. I'd love to instigate new experiments, find better ways to share, and see if we can all together move on down the path on a new phase of the lean journey.